Before we jump into this week's sermon on contentment, I wanted to give all of you parents just a heads up. Next week we'll be in Proverbs 7. We will be talking about sexual purity and pornography. We will not be graphic, and it is a conversation that you should be having with your kids if they are fourth grade or older. We need to be having it at an early age, but if you're not ready for that conversation yet, I just want to give you a heads up so you can have your kids in Sunday school next week. So Proverbs 7 next week. This week we're going to talk about contentment. Now back in 1965, a band called the Rolling Stones released a song you you may have heard heard of. I can't get no satisfaction. Proved to be pretty popular. It immediately rocketed to the top of the Billboard 100 where it stayed for weeks. 40 years later, the magazine Rolling Stones named that the second greatest song ever written. Consistently at the top of charts of best songs ever. Why is it so popular? Why did this song take over the world? Well, two reasons. First of all, because it begins with the greatest guitar lick ever that you all know, and I'm not going to hum it because otherwise it'll stick in your head and you won't hear a thing I say this morning. It's been playing in my head all week since I knew I was going to use this illustration. But second reason that it's so popular is that this song tapped into a universal angst that we all share, a, a universal sense of frustration that we feel about the fact that life cannot satisfy us for long. This song is actually an angry song. It's, it's written as a, a protest song. The Stones sang in anger about the fact that, that materialism and sex could not satisfy them for long. They were upset because they could not find lasting contentment in this life. So the stone's right. Is contentment that lasts impossible to find in this life? Well, it depends on how you define that word contentment. Depends on what you mean by that word. What do most people mean by contentment? Well, the standard definition that you'll hear, if you look in a dictionary, this is what you'll find. Most people by contentment, they mean a feeling, an emotion, a feeling of of happiness about life's circumstances. Actually, if you look it up in the Oxford Dictionary, you'll see that, that contentment is an emotional state of happiness and satisfaction because life is going your way. It's that happy, pleasant feeling you feel when, when life is going well. Now, that idea of, of happiness being contentment, connecting contentment and happiness, that goes back a long time. Humanity's always kind of put those two together, and we, we look at happiness and we tie it to our, our circumstances in life, to favorable circumstances. Actually, it's interesting, if you study the word happy, where did it come from? What does that word mean in English? Well, it goes way back to the 12th century, to the Norse language, 12th century Norse, the word hap, it meant to be lucky. So when it came into English in the 14th century, to be happy meant to be a lucky person, to be prosperous, to have good fortune with your finances. So all the way back to the beginning, happiness was associated with prosperity. If you said that a person was happy, you meant they were prosperous way back in Old English. And so most of the world assumes that, that connection, that, that contentment is, is happiness, it's a feeling, and the way you get that feeling of happiness is you chase prosperity. You want more and more wealth. You want to gather prosperity in your life so you can feel happier and happier. That's what most people assume. It's easy to prove. There was a, a recent survey of, of 2,000 British men and women. They listed out what were the keys to finding contentment in life. And for both men and women, the number one item by far was attain financial security. That was the predominant determiner of whether they could be content or not. Now, you may ask, how much money do you need? What does it take to attain financial security? Well, that's interesting. Lots of studies have been done on that. To feel like you have attained financial security, you must have twice whatever you make now. All the surveys bear the same. Whatever you earn now, double it, and you think you will be content. Now, you get there, you double your current income, and then what do you need? Double again. It's double whatever you have at any moment. That's what it takes to find financial security. People assume that if I can just get more wealth, if I can just double what I have, then I will have contentment. Unfortunately, the data does not support that conclusion. The data doesn't stand up to that. Here's Time Magazine, April 2009. Money does not buy happiness. Once you reach the median level of income, roughly $50,000 a year, wealth and contentment go their separate ways, and studies find that a millionaire is no more likely to be happy than someone earning one-twentieth as much. 
Now, that's the conclusion of research, but you really, you can just go talk to millionaires and find that out. Here's three of the wealthiest men who have ever lived on this planet. John D. Rockefeller, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. W.H. Vanderbilt, for whom the university is named, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. And Henry Ford, the inventor of the modern automobile, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Each of these three men learned later in life, as they look back at their life, that all of this pursuit of wealth left them empty. They were trying to find happiness in prosperity and prosperous circumstances, and it left them unsatisfied. It could never satisfy them for long. They were learning the truth that Proverbs lays out. You see this over and over again in Proverbs. Proverbs 27, 20. Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. Sheol and Abaddon are words in Hebrew for death. So Solomon's saying, death is never satisfied. That's true. It keeps taking more and more of us every day. Death is never satisfied, just like the eyes of human beings are never satisfied. We look around and we always see more that we want. We want to go get more wealth, get more pleasure, get more possessions. We're never satisfied. Solomon wrote that in Proverbs 27 when he was young and wise. Sadly, he ended up proving the truth of that statement later in his life when he became foolish. And when he began to give in to greed and lust, you may not know the background, but Solomon, king of Israel, he became what was at the time the richest man to ever live on the planet accumulated a massive fortune, built opulent palaces. He feasted at every meal, enjoyed exotic foods, wine, anything he wanted, he had all day long. And then he went to bed at night with 300 wives and 700 concubines. So he had every sexual pleasure possible. There was absolutely nothing that he denied himself. Now, what did he find? What was the conclusion of it all? Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes towards the end of his life. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure for my heart was pleased because of all my labor and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was no profit under the sun. So I hated life. For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after wind. So here's a man who enjoyed absolutely everything the world had to offer. Think about his day-to-day life. For Solomon, he woke up in the morning and for the next 12 hours, there was no pleasure he said no to. Life was just an unending succession of pleasures and yet he felt no happiness in it because happiness does not last. It slipped through his fingers and left him an empty husk of a man bitter and depressed and angry at the end of his life. Solomon failed to learn that lesson that I hope all of us learned as children the day after Christmas. What happens the day after Christmas? Well, there's been some toy you have wanted for months some toy that you've just been desperately wanting to get your hands on. For me growing up, it was this, a G.I. Joe F-14 fighter plane. Some of you men out there, you really wanted this too. It was awesome. It was like this big, and the wings swept forward and backwards. It had missiles and bombs. It was just beautiful. It was awesome. So I marked that page in the Toys R Us catalog months before Christmas. I showed it to my parents. I dreamed about having that plane every night. I was sure my life would be complete if I could just get that toy. I wake up on Christmas morning. I run into the living room. There it is. Is, and I'm just overcome with happiness, just so, so overcome by bliss that I couldn't even speak. How long did that feeling of happiness last? Exactly 24 hours. Because I woke up the next morning and all of a sudden I realized with sadness, with disappointment in my heart, that my new toy was suddenly not new. Now it was boring because I tried everything with it. I explored everything you could do. And now I was really sad because I realized it was 364 days till the next Christmas. That left me with a feeling of disappointment that taught me if you seek contentment by chasing after happiness, by chasing after prosperity, it will leave you empty and miserable. Because happiness does not last. The feeling of, of pleasure, it does not last. It cannot last if you chase contentment by running after pleasure, by running after happiness, it will slip through your fingers and leave you empty inside. 
There are so many careers and marriages and lives that have been decimated because people were chasing after a feeling they could never hold on to. If you're seeking contentment in the feeling of happiness, you will live a miserable life. So is there a form of contentment that goes deeper than a feeling? Is there a kind of contentment that's, that's stronger and more resilient than just an emotion that, that, can, that can cling to us even when circumstances in life are going badly? Well, yes, there is. There's a second meaning of contentment that we find in Scripture. The scriptural meaning of the word contentment is different than the dictionary meaning. In the Bible, biblical contentment is not a feeling, it's not an emotion of happiness, it's an attitude. Biblical contentment is an attitude of grateful acceptance of one's life. Now, what do I mean by attitude? Well, an attitude is a way of seeing life. An attitude is, is how you look at your life, how you interpret the events of your life, how you choose to see yourself. Now, that word choose is really important because feelings and emotions, you don't get to choose those. Feelings and emotions like happiness, they come over you or they don't. You're you're passive. You have no choice. You have no activity there to bring that emotion. But an attitude is a choice you make. You get to choose your attitude. You get to choose how you will see your life. You get to choose how you will interpret all of the things that happen to you. You can choose to either see your life as a gift from God that you can give thanks for. Or you can see your life as a curse and see yourself as a victim who's been abandoned by God. You get to make that choice, how you will see yourself, how you will look at your life. Contentment is an attitude. You get to choose how you will see yourself. That's what we find in the most famous passage in the Bible on contentment. It's Philippians chapter 4. Paul talks about the secret of contentment. Here's what he, what he says. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. For Paul, contentment was a choice. You see that in the last line, the most misquoted verse in the whole Bible. I can do all things through him who strengthens me does not mean that your football team can go win their big game. It's not a blanket promise. Can't quote that and go lift 300 pounds in the gym. That's not what those words are about. It's defined by context. What are all things? All things is choosing contentment in any circumstance. Paul had learned that he could choose an attitude of contentment. He could choose to look at his life as a gift from God even when he was hungry, even when he was suffering, even when he was poor. Through the strength that Christ had given him, Paul could choose contentment in any and every situation. So what we learn from that is if I am not content right now, whose fault is that? That's mine. Not God's fault, not the world's fault, not the fault of chance or luck or fortune. That's my fault. Because contentment isn't a feeling, it's not happiness, it's a choice I make. How will I choose to see my life? Contentment is a choice that we make, but it's a hard choice. Because we are not by nature content people. Now, when we wake up in the morning, what we tend to see is all the stuff we don't have, all the stuff we wish we had. So by nature, we're not content. Contentment is hard. That's why Paul says, you notice right there at the beginning, he had to learn contentment. This is something he had to work at. This is something he had to to practice in his life. He had to grow and cultivate this attitude of contentment over many years. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. How do you grow this attitude of contentment in your life? What practical things can you do this week to help you become a more content person? I'm going to give you four things from the book of Proverbs, four very practical, concrete things that you can begin to do this week that will cultivate within you an attitude or a heart of contentment. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There's much more that the Bible says about contentment in other passages. We're just going to focus on these four things in Proverbs to get you started down the path of contentment. So what can you do to begin to grow contentment in your life? Well, the first thing Proverbs tells us is fear the Lord. 
If you want to live a life of contentment, if you want to develop this attitude of contentment in your life, you have to fear the Lord. That's what Solomon tells us in Proverbs 19, verse 23. He says, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. Now, all of us want the second part of that verse right? It's a modern world so full of stress and anxiety. We go to bed at night and we usually feel upset or anxious or, or angry or, or bitter or guilty or, or ashamed about something we did. What we really want is to go to bed at night, put our head on our pillow and feel peace. We want to feel satisfied about our lives. We want to feel safe and protected. How do you get there? How do you have that peace and satisfaction deep in your soul when you go to bed at night? Well, Solomon says you do it by fearing the Lord. But what does that mean? That word fear is kind of tricky, has a wide range of meaning in the Bible, everything from abject terror to simply respect. You have to study the context to wrap your hands around what an author meant by fear. When you look at Proverbs, I think Solomon has two things in mind when he talks about fearing the Lord. The first thing, if you want to fear the Lord, number one, you got to believe in the Lord. That kind of goes without saying. You, you cannot fear a God you don't believe in. You, you got to believe in God to fear him, but not just any God. You got to believe in this God, the God of the Bible. You have to believe that he exists. You have to believe that he's real. You have to believe that he's your creator and your king and your savior. You got to believe in this God to fear the Lord. Now, how will belief in this God give you peace and satisfaction when you put your head on the pillow at night? Well, very simple. Think about this God. This God is not like other gods. Other gods make you work for their love. Other gods make you work so that you can be accepted by them. That's the God Allah of of Islam. You've got to obey the five pillars to be acceptable to him. But that's not this God. This God offers his love and forgiveness as a free gift. This God offers you eternal life by simply believing that he sent his son to die for your sins and rise from the dead. The moment that you believe that truth, that Jesus died for you, this God gives you forgiveness and eternal life and infinite love as a completely free gift. And so when you go to bed at night, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what things are making you anxious, you can know in that moment that there is a God in heaven who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven. And that is a belief that can give you peace. That can give you incredible peace. You have freedom from fear and shame and guilt because God has forgiven every sin you've ever committed or will ever commit. Fear of the Lord, it begins with belief in God, the God of Scripture, and belief in Him gives us peace. But fear does not end with belief. It includes more than just belief. The second part of what Solomon means by fearing the Lord is obeying the Lord. To fear the Lord, we must obey the Lord. Because think about it, when I choose not to obey the Lord, when I choose to rebel against God, what am I saying about God? What do my actions say about my beliefs about God? Well, what they say is that God's not a big deal to me. God's really not that great in my eyes, not that big, not that important, not worthy enough to merit my obedience. So when we disobey God, we are doing the exact opposite of fearing God, because fearing God means lifting God up, seeing him as big, as great, as a little bit terrifying. So it means to fear God. You see him as so worthy, so wonderful, that you respond in obedience. Now, that obedience does not earn heaven. Again, heaven is a a free gift, but, but Proverbs is clear. If you want to enjoy contentment in your life, you must obey God. Think of it this way. Here's a simple equation for you. Obedience breeds contentment. Sin steals contentment. Okay? Obedience breeds contentment. It builds contentment in your life. Sin steals contentment. It robs you of contentment. Really easy to prove. Think about the person who has just cheated on their spouse or stolen money at work or taken illegal drugs. They put their head down on that pillow at night. Do they feel peace? No. No, they feel fear, they feel guilt, they feel shame. They're stressed, they're anxious because they're trying to cover their tracks, delete those text messages, make sure no one saw them. That's the opposite of peace. If you want to enjoy peace and satisfaction in life, the only way is through obedience. You obey the Lord and it builds peace in your life. 
The author of Hebrews tells us something in chapter 12. It's it's a short little phrase that I absolutely love, one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible. He tells us that if you will grow in obedience, if you will learn to obey the Lord in every area of life, he will create in your life, he will build in your life the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Peaceful fruit of righteousness. That's a really dense phrase. You unpack it. What God is saying is that the fruit of righteousness or obedience is peace. When you choose to obey, when you choose to walk in righteousness, the result in your life is peace. The author is picturing obedience as a tree. And as that tree grows, it produces fruit in your life, and that fruit is peace. Obedience is like an apple tree. Apples are like peace. If you want to know peace and satisfaction in your life, there is a way. Obey. That's how you get peace. That's how you get true contentment that lasts. Proverbs puts it this way, better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. The world thinks that the way to happiness, the way to contentment is through wealth. They are wrong. The way to contentment, the way through to peace and satisfaction is through righteousness, through learning to obey the Lord and walk with him. That's the first step. If you want to find contentment in your life, learn to obey the Lord. Second step that God lays out for us, If you want to grow in an attitude of contentment, number two, give thanks. Learn to give thanks to God. Married men, let me ask you a question. If you're a married man, what advice are we given for fighting sexual temptation? What are we supposed to do to fight sexual temptation? Well, we're supposed to to focus our attention, our energy on not looking at other women. Not thinking about women who aren't our wives. That's good advice. But that's only, actually only half of, of the story. Only half of how you battle sexual temptation. Solomon gives you the other half. Here's the other half, men. Proverbs chapter 5. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. First of all, married men, that's our favorite passage in the Bible. Read it often. It's wonderful. Second, when we think about how to battle sexual temptation, it's only half the story to say, hey, don't go look at other women. No, actually, focus most of your attention on looking at the right woman. Focus your attention on your wife. Think about her. Look for everything good about her. Rejoice in her. Find things to give thanks in her. That's how you battle temptation, is you learn to give thanks for what is yours. Okay, here's another example, wealth. When it comes to wealth, I think most of us in this room, probably a safe bet, most of us fit what the world would call middle class. We're we're middle class people. We're not super rich. We're not super poor. Now, as middle class people, most middle class people spend a lot of their lives, a lot of their time, thinking about accumulating more money. If we only have more money, then life would be great for us. But here's what Proverbs says about wealth. Proverbs 38 through 9, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. What Solomon is telling us is that there are advantages to being middle class. It's a good place to be. Because you're not poor where you're tempted to steal, and you're not rich where you're tempted to to be proud and self-reliant. Actually, great wealth is a great danger to your spiritual life. So Solomon is saying what we need to do is we need to stop in our middle class lives, and we need to see all the advantages that are part of our circumstances, our condition. What Proverbs is teaching us to do is to stop and give thanks for whatever our circumstances are, whatever your relational status, whatever your educational status, whatever your career status, whatever your financial status, whatever your health status, Proverbs wants you to understand that there are advantages to find and give thanks for in whatever status or condition you're in right now. Now, for some of you, that feels hard to do. Because for you right now, life is really hard. It's painful. You're suffering. It's really hard to see anything good in this moment. And so I would remind you what Paul said in Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Not a promise about lifting 300 pounds in the gym. It's a promise about contentment. Even when you're suffering, even when life is hard, you can choose contentment. You can choose to have an attitude of contentment. How? Through Christ who lives in you. 
You can choose contentment by giving thanks. At this moment, whatever you're facing, you have something you can say thank you for. Something you can look to God and say thank you for that thing, God. If you don't, if you don't learn to give thanks in these circumstances, right this moment, even if you don't like your circumstances and your condition, I would remind you of the wise advice of Socrates. He who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would like to have. If you don't learn contentment now, you're never going to learn it. Not in this world that's so full of pain and suffering. Circumstances are never going to line up where contentment comes easy for you. You got to learn it now. You got to learn to give thanks. Practical advice for you guys as you think about this. I would encourage you to get in the habit of writing out things you're thankful for. For me, during my sabbatical over the last couple months, I found that if I, if I don't practice this discipline, if I don't work at giving thanks, then I'll wake up in the morning and I'll start my day and I will quickly get preoccupied with all the things I wish I had. So I'm driving down the street and I see a lot of nice cars. I love nice cars and I think about how much I'd like that nice car. Or I see people going to a job that really seems exciting to me. And man, I really wish I had that opportunity. Or I see people on Facebook going on amazing vacations that I'm not going on. And I just think about, man, I I'm missing so much. And I was convicted over that. That's not the attitude that I need to be walking through my sabbatical with. And so what I did is I got a journal, even though I type almost everything these days. Once in a while, it's nice to just write. And every morning I'd wake up, and before I open the Bible, first part of my quiet time, take out a pen, write five things. Five things in my journal that I'm thankful for. Some of them were really deep, like I'm thankful that Jesus died for my sins. Some of them were really tiny, like I'm thankful that it's 65 degrees today and I'm sitting outside. And all of them are appropriate. Anything, whether big or small, simple or deep, you just write it down. Five things every day, you're writing these things down and it begins to build a habit in your life. You find yourself going through the day seeing something and saying thank you for that. So last night, the kids and I and Julie are out watching fireworks at George Bush. It was hot. And I did not want to be there. It was late and I knew I had to preach this morning. And my son was wanting to sit on my lap and he's just like this ball of energy that overheats me. And I was not comfortable at all and I was feeling pretty upset about it. And then I stopped and I thought, okay, wait a minute. I need to find some things to be grateful for. And right that moment, the breeze blew. Such a tiny little thing. Breeze blue, and I, wow, that right there, that's not, that's not a minor thing when you're sitting outside in July in Texas. And I gave thanks for that. And I began to look around for things to give thanks for, and it changed my attitude, and all of a sudden, there was contentment. So if you will learn to give thanks, write out five things a day that you're thankful for, that will begin to grow within you a content heart. Fourth, or third thing that, that Proverbs lays out for us, if you want to grow contentment in your life, you've got to learn to work hard. In this discussion about contentment, it's really important to make a clear distinction here between two C words. Two words that begin with C. Contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not the same thing as complacency. A lot of people do not have the things they need in life an education or, or the money they need or the job they need, and it's because they've not worked for them. They've been lazy. They've not worked hard. Now, some people lack those things for reasons that are completely out of their control. That's not their fault. They just need to trust God. But for some of us, we don't have the things that we need because we've not worked for them. And Proverbs convicts us over that. Proverbs does not say, hey, you should be content to continue to lack that thing and be lazy. The Proverbs says things like this. Do not love sleep or you will become poor. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with food. Do you want satisfaction? Do you want contentment in life? Then you, you need to learn to work hard. You, you can't be lazy in life. If there's some opportunities you've missed out on because you have been lazy, then it is time to get to work. You need to understand God will never bless laziness. Never Contentment requires hard work in life. Here's Proverbs 6. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. What do you need to be content in life? Well, you don't need riches. You don't need a particular educational degree. You don't need a particular relational status, but you must work hard. Whatever task God has given you, you must put your hands and your mind to it and do it with diligence as unto the Lord. If you will do that, if you will work hard in life, then God will bless you when you are putting your head on your pillow with the sleep that only hardworking people know. 
There's a quality of peaceful sleep that comes through hard work that the rest of the world doesn't know about. Okay, so contentment requires hard, hard work. That's the third step. Fourth step, find contentment you must give to those in need. We're all familiar with Jesus' advice that it is better to give than to receive. But how is it better? Clearly, it's better for the person who just received. They now have something they wouldn't. And it's better for the world in general for all giving to those in need. But Jesus meant something more. He meant that it's, it's better for you when you give to someone in need. Your life will be better when you choose to give away what you have, to share what's yours with someone in need. That's a, a theme you see throughout the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 19, 17. One who is gracious to the poor, to a poor man lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his good deed. Now repay, that's not just about finances. This is not a promise that if you give a dollar to charity today, God will return $10 to you tomorrow. That's the prosperity gospel and it is a lie. That's not what this is about. This is about a, a promise to bless you. God is going to bless your life with peace and joy and contentment that only he can provide. If you will give to those in need, if you will give sacrificially, God will bless you. Here's what it says in Proverbs 22. He who is generous will be blessed for he gives some of his food to the poor. But on the flip side, if you will not give to those in need, Proverbs 21, he who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be answered. And so if you're feeling very unsatisfied about your life right now, if you feel very distant from the Lord and very discouraged, one of the questions you should ask yourself, there's many questions you should ask, but one of the questions you should ask is, have I given to someone in need sacrificially? Now, how much do you need to give? Varies from person to person. Whatever it takes to make a sacrifice, whatever you have to to give so that you're giving something up to care for somebody in need, have you given recently? If not, then, then you need to recognize that, that contentment is a gift that God reserves for the generous. And contentment is a gift God reserves for generous people. Now, again, this is not some kind of mathematical equation. God's not saying if you give $10 to charity today, you will sleep better tonight. That's not how this works. What he is saying, though, is if your habit in life is not to be generous, if you're not giving sacrificially to those in need, then you should not expect contentment. That's not what God's going to give you. you. You must become a generous person if you want to live a contented life. Okay, let's get practical for a moment. Let's look at these four principles again that, that God has given us through the book of Proverbs. What God wants us to understand about contentment is that it is not a feeling. Contrary to what the world says, contentment is not happiness. If you are trying to find contentment by chasing happiness, by chasing prosperity, by chasing pleasure, it's going to make you a worthless and miserable person. You'll never find it. You'll never grasp onto it. Contentment is an attitude. It's an attitude that you choose. It's how you choose to see your life. Contentment is looking at your life with all of its ups and downs and saying, I believe this is a gift from God. That's contentment, an attitude that you choose. But that's a hard choice to make because life this side of heaven is really painful, full of suffering. So how do you grow in your ability to believe that your life is a gift? How do you grow your attitude of of contentment? Well, you, you do these four things really practically. On a week-by-week basis, you practice these disciplines. Now, which one do you need to apply this week? I don't know. I would encourage each of you to look at that list and pick one. Now, don't pick the easy one. Don't pick the one up there that you're like, got that licked, all right, that's mine. No, that's not yours. You got that one. Pick the one that you look at and you say, I did not like when Blake talked about that. That's, that's the one that God is calling you to work on this week. Whatever one you struggle with and felt conviction over, you need to choose that principle and you need to apply it this week. Let me give you some specific ideas here. If you look at the list and number one was your big one, fear of the Lord, uh, that's what you need to focus on. If, if, if you struggle to fear the Lord because you struggle to believe in him, it's hard for you to believe that, that the God of the Bible exists, then I would encourage you, please come talk to me or someone else here this morning. Let's, let's help you to grow in faith. That's where contentment will start. Or maybe fear of the Lord is hard for you because you've got some area of disobedience in your life, some secret sin that has been part of your life for a long time that you can't seem to conquer, and that's stealing your contentment. If that's the case, if that's you, and I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to I'm going to encourage you to do something bold. I'm going to encourage you to expose that area of weakness to someone. 
to another person who, who is godly, who is walking with the Lord. That can be a pastor, that could be me, that could be a leader, that could just be a godly friend in your life. You need to, to go to that person and you need to be open. You need to open the doors to your life and say, here's what I'm struggling with. You gotta understand, secret sins are invincible so long as they remain secret. You, you cannot overcome them if you, you keep them private. That doesn't mean you need to tell everyone here, but you gotta tell somebody who can pray for you and hold you accountable and help you to grow. So do whatever it takes to grow in obedience so you can fear the Lord. Maybe you look at the list and number two is getting at you. It's convicting you. You are not a very gracious or grateful person. I would encourage you to do what I talked about earlier. Get yourself a journal and begin every morning to write out five things that you're thankful for. Okay, just write them out just really quickly as you begin your day. Begin to practice that. Look for triggers as you go through the day to, to find things to be thankful for and give thanks to God. If you get in that habit of giving thanks, it will change your attitude towards life. Maybe it's number three, working hard. You look at your life and you think, man, I've been lazy. There's some opportunities I have missed because I have not worked hard. First of all, realize all of us struggle with laziness from time to time. You're not alone in that. What I'm going to encourage you to do is, is to get radical to cut laziness out of your life. You need to set a schedule that, that gets you studying, gets you to work on time, gets you to the gym. You need to set a schedule, and then this is the hard part. You're going to need to remove the things that distract you. If you're a lazy person, then you're going to probably need to jump off of Facebook. Just shut down that account. You don't need Facebook. No one in this room will ever need Facebook. So shut it down if that's what's distracting you. Or if it's Xbox, just go sell it. If it's cable TV, cut the cable. Do whatever it takes because God will never bless laziness. Whatever it takes in your life to begin to work harder so that you can please the Lord with your labors. Uh, or maybe it's number four, giving to those in need. You look at your life and there's, you're not giving much to charity. That's not a normal part of your life. Now, maybe because you don't have a lot of money. And I, I just want to remind you, this is not about how much we give. It may be that realistically, giving $5 a month is a sacrifice for you. If that's it, that's fine. That, that's all God wants is for you to make a sacrifice. Maybe $5 a month, it may be $5,000 a month. Whatever it is, you need to be practicing the habit of charity, of giving to those in need. Now, if you don't know anyone in need and don't know of, of a godly charity to give to, then I would encourage you to go to our website. If you click on Serve, you will see a list for partner organizations. They are charities throughout Bryan College Station that, are, that we have vetted. They are excellent charities caring for those in need. Choose one of them that resonates with your heart and begin to give to that charity. If you're confused, if you can't find it, just email me, call me. I'll help you find a charity that you can begin to give to regularly so that you can build this habit in your life. A contentment. It is possible. The Rolling Stones were wrong. The problem was they, they defined their word wrong. <laughs> you can be satisfied. You can find contentment if you will stop chasing it in a feeling and find it in an attitude. If you will grow that attitude by practicing these four steps, you'll wake up one day and realize, man, I, I'm finding a lot more contentment and satisfaction in my life. And let's go to the Lord and pray for his help to grow as people of contentment. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you that contentment and satisfaction are really possible. But Lord, we grieve for the people of this world who are foolishly chasing contentment in the pleasures of wealth, in the pleasures of sex, they think that if they can just feel happy, that life will be complete. Oh, Father, they're so lost and blind and foolish. They're hurting themselves. We grieve for them and we pray, open their eyes. Father, help them to see. Please help them to believe. The example of Solomon, the example of Rockefeller and Vanderbilt and, and Ford, that no matter how many millions of dollars they accumulate, how much sex they have, how much pleasure they enjoy, they will never be satisfied in it. I pray that you would open their eyes so that they would turn to you. And when they turn to you, Lord, I pray that they would see us and that we would be ready to share with them the good news that there is a God in heaven who loves them so much that he sent his son to die for their sins so that they could spend eternity in heaven with you. I pray that we would be bold to share the gospel with a hurting world. 
But Father, we recognize that for them to be attracted to the gospel, they need to see contentment in our lives. They need to see satisfaction in us. And so, Father, we pray, help us, grow us to be contented people. Contentment doesn't come easy to us. We get so caught up in the things that we do not have, the things that we wish we had. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us of that and that you would challenge us and convict us and transform us so that we might become more content people. Lord, we we confess and we praise you. You are our Father. We are loved in you. We thank you for that. We pray that you would help us to be grateful for our lives, that we would see our lives as a gift from you to be joyfully received. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of your Son. In his name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. I'll see you next week.